Father, we thank you so very much for this morning. I thank you for every person in this room. And God, I pray that we would listen intently to your word this morning and that you would remove all distractions. Probably one of the most important messages that will be preached from this stage all year. So, cause it to penetrate into our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I truly believe that. I believe that this is probably one of the most important messages. I can tell you this, it'll be one of the most sobering messages preached from this pulpit this year. This message is going to be very uncomfortable for some of you. Our, we're going to be looking at John chapter 11 today. John chapter 11. The title of this morning's message is Spiritual Desertion. Another name would be Divine Abandonment. You see the sobering truth here in John chapter 11. Primarily... The subject comes from verse 54, but just so we understand the immediate context, we're going to look at that passage that I preached on last week, we're going to read it again, but the subject of spiritual desertion will be coming from verse 54. It's one of those passages that if you're not careful, you'll just overlook. Casual reading of the Bible, perhaps you would even miss it. But there is a profound event, truth, happening in verse 54. The Bible says in verse 45, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and who had seen what he did, they believed in him. And we, re- we rejoice in that, right? That some saw the te- heard the teaching of Jesus, they saw the miracles of Jesus, and some of them received Jesus genuinely into their lives praise God but verse 46 but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said what are we to do for this man performs many signs and by the way that is an act of grace the fact that Jesus was performing signs in their midst Jesus was bearing witness of himself to them. Not just once, but many times. Verse 48. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. In other words, if we let Jesus continue, it's going to cost us something. We're going to have to give up something. We might lose something. But one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Now look at verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Now notice what's happening here before we look at verse 54. Throughout the Gospel of John, up to this point, Jesus has had a public witness. He's been preaching. He's been teaching publicly. And also performing miracles publicly. We know that to be true because the the Pharisees themselves have already testified that he's been performing many miracles. And if he keeps it up, uh, Rome may come against us and we may lose our nation and we may lose our temple. But what I want you to notice is that it's the grace of God, the grace of God that allows these rejectors of Christ to keep receiving a witness. They've rejected Christ numerous times 
But up to this point, point, God keeps providing them a witness. You see that? They keep rejecting every teaching they've rejected. Every miracle they've rejected. They keep rejecting Jesus, but Jesus keeps, keeps preaching. He keeps teaching. He keeps performing miracles. This is the grace of God giving them one opportunity after another. Do you see it? But eventually, the patience of God runs out. Because we come to verse 54. Jesus, therefore, no longer. I'll say it again. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to the town of Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. Remember, public preaching, public teaching, public witnessing, they kept on rejecting, and eventually Jesus did what? He withdrew his preaching, he withdrew his teaching, he withdrew his miracles, he withdrew his witness from them. We see spiritual desertion. Just in that phrase, that Jesus no longer walked openly, it was an act of the Lord giving them over to what they desired. They desired the world. They desired sin. They desired their tradition. And because they desired the world, and because they desired sin, and because they desired their tradition instead of Christ, what did Jesus do? Jesus says, okay, that's what you want. That's what you'll have. And he removed his witness from them. This is, this is something that's also taught in other parts of the Bible. I mean, this is not something that is just an obscure truth. I mean, the evidence of this reality is, is throughout Scripture. Think about this verse for a moment. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave the house or town. Jesus says, listen, if you go to a place to witness, but they don't listen to you, they don't receive you, Jesus says, leave from there and shake the dust off of your feet. Now, what does that mean? Shake the dust off of your feet. It was a symbolic act of judgment. What we have here is a picture of what God did in the Old Testament to Sodom and Gomorrah. God is saying, if they won't receive you, if they won't listen to you, then you leave there and you shake the dust off of your feet so that no part of them is left on you. Why? Because I'm going to bring destruction upon them just like I did at Sodom and Gomorrah. Spiritual desertion. Divine abandonment. Because they would not listen and they would not receive. It's a scary thought when Jesus chooses to deal with a man or woman no longer. When the general call of God goes out and a man, and a man or woman persist in their rejection. There will come a time when God gives that person over to deal with them no longer. The Bible says of King Saul, you remember King Saul in the Old Testament, the Bible said, and the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. An evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. 
God deserted Saul. Because Saul continued to reject the Lord. Paul spoke of this when he was writing to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 1 verse 24 we find this sobering passage. Therefore God gave them over. That's divine abandonment. That's spiritual desertion. Therefore God gave Look at that. God gave them over. To what? To the lust of their hearts, to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. He's talking about sexual sin. They wanted their sex and sin more than they did Christ. And so they kept rejecting the truth. They kept rejecting the truth over and over again. They'd reject the truth. And so eventually the Lord says, listen, you love that more than you do me, have it. He gives them over. The Greek word is paradidomai. It's a very intense verb. The verb was used when Christ was handed over to be beaten and nailed to a cross. It's the same verb that's used when a person hands over. The Bible talks about they handed over their bodies to be burned in the book of Hebrews. Paradidomai, an intense verb. They were handed over. It's a verb that's used when a person is thrown into prison. They're handed over. And, and the Lord says when they, there comes a time when a person persists in their rejected, rejection of me that they're paradidomai. They are intensely handed over. God hands a person over indirectly and directly. How does God hand a, hand a person over indirectly? By removing his restraining protective hand. Even those who are unsaved, as a result of the general grace of God, it, to a measure, they have the restraining, protective hand of God on their lives. But when a person persists in their rejection, he hands them over indirectly by removing his restraining, protective hand. And when he removes his restraining, protective hand, then that means that the consequences of sin are inevitably allowed in your life. And what are the consequences of sin? A destructive course. A degrading lifestyle. To the point that the the image of God becomes debased in a person's life. It strips them. If a person can continues in their rejection, then God indirectly removes his restraining protective hand and he gives them over to the consequences of their sin, which brings about indignity and loss of peace and a seared conscience. But the handing of God, the handing of, of someone over also happens not only indirectly, but directly. Indirectly, God removes his restraining protective hand. Directly, God says, I will deal with you no more. And I have more examples of this in the Bible. Judges chapter 10, verse 13. You have forsaken me and served other gods. You have what? You've forsaken, you've served other gods. Therefore, I will save you what? No more. 
No more. I've given you all this opportunity. <laughs> I've even saved you physically time after time after time. I've bore witness time after time after time. And you keep forsaking me. Therefore, I will save you no more. Done. Now we're not talking about someone who's genuinely saved. We're talking about those who have rejected Christ. Second Chronicles 15 verse 2. And when he went out to meet Asa, and he said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all of Judah, Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. There's a mystery here that we don't fully understand. When does God ultimately give a person over? We don't know. And we don't know if a person is ultimately given over, do we? It's not, it's, we don't give them over. We can't discern that. We can't discern whether a person has ultimately been given over by God. We can't discern that. You say, but they're living a certain lifestyle. They're living a lifestyle of homosexuality or lesbianism or, or whatever it may be. Obviously, God's handed them over. You don't know that. You don't know that. But they're in prison for all types of gross immorality and, and murder and rape or whatever it may be. Obviously, God's not going to deal with that person any longer. Obviously, God's given them over. You don't know that. We don't know when, when God gives a person over. We don't know who, give, who God gives over. All we know is that God gives people over. And the giving over of God is not giving something, giving someone something they don't want. It's not like a person is the best. I really want to be saved. Nope, I'm giving you over. No. It's when God gives a person what they really want anyway. We see a great example of this in the nation of Israel. You remember during the judges, God was their king. But they didn't want God, they wanted what? They wanted their own king. We want a king, we want a king. It's not my will to give you a king. We want a king, though. Okay, you want a king? I'll give you what you want. Here's King Saul. So the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It's a terrible thing to be given over to your own lust and depravity. You don't, listen, you don't know how sick and depraved and how sinful you could be until the Lord removes his restraining protective hand. Until God fully gives you over to the depravity of your own fleshly desire. You don't know how terrible it is to no longer feel the conviction of God. To no longer hear the voice of God. To no longer feel the drawing of God. But there comes a day. When is it for people? I don't know. Is it possible for a person to reject Christ one time and for God to never deal with them again? Yes. But is it possible for, so, for God to deal with someone 500 times? Yes. We're not the same. God doesn't deal with every person the same way. What we do know is this, is that when you hear the gospel and you, and you hear the teaching, you hear the preaching, 
you hear the voice of the Lord speaking and you reject him, you don't, what, you, what we do know is this, is that you don't have the assurance that you'll ever hear it again. You don't have the assurance that you'll ever feel the conviction again. You don't have the assurance that God will give you another opportunity again. Every time a person hears truth and rejects truth, there's a callousing of the heart that takes place. And when the heart is callous so many times, it eventually is hardened. then there's a giving over. What causes this spiritual desertion? When does does spiritual desertion occur? For three reasons. Let me share them with you. Spiritual desertion occurs when a man or a woman loves the world more than they do Christ. Do we not see that in our passage this morning? If Jesus keeps on preaching and teaching, then Rome's going to come and they're going to take what? Our world away. They're going to take our materialism away. They're going to take our wealth away. They're going to take our power away. They're going to take our prestige away. They're going to take our prosperity away. They're going to take our popularity away. And we can't do with that because we love the world more than we do Christ. There are so many today who are unwilling, even though they've witnessed over and over again the the, the testimony of Christ, they sat under the preaching of Christ, they've heard the gospel, but yet they, 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 they keep saying no. In the in the in the foolishness of this idea that that you're going, you don't have to receive Christ, and it's especially true among young people. Well, when I get older, I'll give my life to Christ. You don't have the promise that he'll give you an, a chance. You don't have the promise that your heart will be as sensitive as it is now. I'll just give my life to Christ whenever I, whenever I feel like it. I'll just give my life to Christ when I'm older and I get tired of doing the things I'm doing now. How foolish to gamble with your soul. But the reality is is that so many reject Christ because they love the world more than they do Christ. They love their they love their power. They want to see they you know what I mean by love their power? They love the idea of living the life the way they want to live it. Instead of letting Christ be Lord and Savior. They like the power. They like the prestige and the prosperity that the world has to offer. Wasn't that the case with the rich young ruler when he encountered Jesus? What must I do to be saved? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. I do love my neighbor. I've done that since I was a little boy. And I fast and I pray and I tithe and I do all these wonderful things. So in the eyes of man, he was a morally good person. Jesus said, there's one thing you lack. Sell off everything you own and give it to the poor. Jesus was revealing to that man the depravity of his heart. He said he loved Christ, but he didn't love Christ. He loved the world more than Christ because he wasn't willing to get rid of his power and his prosperity and his prestige and his popularity. Many people are forfeiting their souls, choosing hell, eternal damnation, For the temporary pleasures of this fading world. It's nothing more than idolatry. The worship of an idol. It may not be a totem pole in your backyard. Or a physical Hindu statue that you can see with your eyes. But it's the idol of yourself. The idol of the world. What does the Bible say about loving the world? Does it not say, do not love the world? 
or the things in the world? If anyone loves the world, the love of God is not in him. Spiritual desertion occurs when a person consistently chooses to love the world more than they do Christ. And eventually the Lord says, okay, you want the world? You want the world's power, prestige, popularity? You want all that stuff in the world? You want to do what the world says is cool? And you want to do what the world says is fun? You want to buy into the world's philosophies? You keep wanting that rather than me? Here you go. You can have it. Pray to God that never happens to you. And if you keep putting Christ off, you don't know when it will happen. But if you keep putting him off, it will happen. Spiritual desertion occurs when a man or a woman loves sin more than they do Christ. They love the the pleasure of sin, the possibilities of sin, the promise of sin. There's a pleasure that comes along with sin. That's why so many people choose to, that's why so many people choose premarital sex or choose adultery or all these things is because there's a pleasure that comes along with these things. There's a pleasure with all sin, but sexual sin seems to be the, 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 the pandemic of our world today. Every, every TV show, sex, every commercial, sex. And everywhere you go, it's all about sex and people seeking to gratify their, gratify their own sexual desires and, and people caught up in pornography and prostitution and adultery and fornication and all these things. And, 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 it, and at the end of the day, it's because they're Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Even though they may have a form of godliness, but yet their life denies the power. And they choose the pleasure of sin because of its possibility. What does sin say? What's the possibility of sin? If you don't do this, you're going to miss out. But if you give your life to Christ, you've got to live different as if giving your life to Christ is a prison sentence or something. It's freedom. That's when you truly begin to live. Folks, this is nothing new. It's spiritual warfare. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when the, saint, when the serpent said, God, I'm paraphrasing, eat of this fruit. You'll be like God. In other words, God's holding out on you. There's so many more pleasures out there. God's holding out on you. But if you give in, you give in to this, then you'll be able to experience the wonders. Isn't that what is the wonders of the world and the, gratif- the gratification of sin? And it's the very same thing that Satan tempted Jesus with in the wilderness. He brought him to the pinnacle of the mountain and he said, you see all this? If you follow me, I'll give it to you. All this pleasure, all this popularity, all this, all this prestige. You see the world, you follow me, I'll give it to you. You see the sin, you follow me, I'll give it to you. And we live in a world today where people are so, they, 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 don't, they, they live their life in light of the here and now. Listen, folks, I don't know how else to do it. I'm gonna tear, I don't want to tear up anybody's guitar, but can I unplug this? Okay. You see this blue strip on this, on this cord? Yes or no? 
You see that blue strip? That blue strip represents the temporary life that you're living right now. You got it? The rest of this represents eternity. And so many of you are forfeiting eternity in heaven with the Lord because you want to satisfy your fleshly desires right now and the temporal here and now. You want the world. You want the sins of the world. Look, it's just it's that when this is waiting. Pastor, you sound desperate in your preaching this morning. You, you're preaching like you're in a cage fight, Pastor. Yes! I'm desperate. I'm pleading. I'm fighting. I'll share this passage with you. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 11. As we talk about loving sin more than you do Christ. And you do that consistently and eventually you'll be handed over. God will deal with you no more. And yes, for those of you theologians out there, I preach and I plead in light of the sovereignty of God. Because if your theology doesn't lead you to fight and to preach and to plead and to beg and to win souls, then your theology is of hell instead of heaven. And no one believes in the sovereignty of God. Well, I don't want to sound like Donald Trump. No one believes in the sovereignty of God more than I do. And if anybody knows about the sovereignty of God, I know about the sovereignty of God. No. I believe as much in the sovereignty of God as George Whitfield, as Jonathan Edwards, as John Calvin. Shall I go on? I believe in as much as the sovereignty of God as those men believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe in the sovereignty of God as much as Charles Spurgeon. But as Charles Spurgeon preached with urgency, so I seek to follow his example. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. How can, we, how can we get in the pulpit and preach self-help and tell jokes? And I'm not saying you can't tell jokes, but you just preach this old flippy, floppity junk that's being preached when, 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 people, when there's this battle going on for the souls of men and women. All right, Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which to amounts to idolatry. Idolatry, For it is because of these things, what? Listen, I, can't, I didn't make this stuff up. It's because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. We won't read all that. That's pretty stout. When a person consistently chooses the world over Christ, a divine abandonment will occur. When a person consistently chooses sin over Christ, a divine abandonment will occur. When? I don't know. How many times? I don't know. If he abandons a person, does that mean he'll never come back and deal with them again? In some cases, but not all cases. But you don't have the promise in Scripture that he'll come back. All you have the promise is if you keep on rejecting him, is eventually he'll give you over. That's the only promise you have. You don't have a promise that he'll come and deal with you again. It's a possibility, but you don't have the promise. Spiritual desertion, number three, occurs, and I'm closing. Spiritual desertion occurs when a man or a woman 
consistently loves their tradition more than Christ. They love their tradition. They love their sin. They love the world. So many people love tradition more than they do Christ. What does that look like? That looks like a Catholic who bases their salvation on the seven sacraments. That's tradition. That's not Christ. Or or a church of Christ who bases their salvation on their baptism. That's, that's, that's not Christ. That's tradition. Or a Baptist who bases their salvation on because they walked an aisle and signed a card and prayed a little prayer. It's tradition. See, I didn't just pick, pick, make sure I didn't just pick on the Catholics and Church of Christ. I picked on the Baptists too, okay? There's so many people love tradition. And since we are in a Baptist church, so many people, they love their tradition more than they do Christ. Wait a minute. I, I walked an aisle. I prayed a prayer. I got baptized. I mean, that's what Baptist church tells me to do, right? So I followed the traditions of the Baptist church. So many people go through the motions and never love Jesus. And modern day Christianity will send you straight to hell. Yep, I said it. Because what's modern day Christianity? No life change, no conversion. Just pray this little prayer, get baptized, and keep living life the way you want to live it. And so many people love tradition. They love that. But they love that over Christ. Because when you truly receive Christ, you don't have to make changes. When you truly receive Christ, He makes changes in you. Any man that's in Christ is a new creature. The old things have passed away and all, behold, all things have become new. Unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. You'll know them by their fruits, Jesus said. Shall I keep going? Faith without works is what? Dead. Shall I keep going? These are people who have a form, form of godliness, but they deny the power. You say, Pastor, I still don't know if I've bought into this yet or not, that God eventually gives people over. Well, I don't know what else to show you, but I can't tell you this. Ask Noah. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? 120 years. Did you know that? That means that for a 120 years, God gave the people on the earth time to repent. They had an opportunity to repent as long as it took Noah to build the ark. 120 years, God kept witnessing to them. God witnessed to them through their conscience. God witnessed to them through creation. God witnessed to them through the preaching of Moses and to the building of the ark. God kept witnessing. God kept giving them opportunity, but they kept on rejecting. And eventually, God gave them over. Flood came. How long will God keep dealing with you? This could be it. I don't know. It's possible. It's possible that some of you will never feel the conviction of God right, as, as much as you do right now in your life to give your life to Christ. Will you surrender or will you reject? You do understand that these statements like, I'm just not ready yet, or you understand those things? That those are, that's, these are not, these are, these are rejections, 
right? You understand that, right? It's rejections. Some I don't think we understand that. This is rejection. Those of us who are saved, what are we to do in light of this? We are to listen. We don't know when God gives a person over. We don't know when a final hardening takes place. We don't know. So what's our responsibility? We keep on loving. We keep on praying. We keep on sharing. Just like Noah did. Keep on loving people. Keep on praying for people. Keep on sharing with people as long as they'll listen. What's the word for those of you here today who have kept putting, who have kept, who keep putting Christ off and he and his grace has brought you here today to hear this truth? I'll keep it short. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray for those of us who are saved. that we would come to this altar and that we would call people out by name for those who are not saved, for those who have heard and heard and heard, but yet they keep rejecting. I pray that we would love them, pray for them, and share with them. Share as long as they'll listen, but never stop loving Never stop praying for them. So who would the Lord have you to come pray for? Who does the Lord want you to keep loving, keep praying for, and to keep sharing with as long as they'll listen? Who is it? Would you come and call them out by name this morning here at the altar? Others of you, you hear the voice of the Lord this morning? convicting, drawing, then would you come and surrender your life to him? We have counselors down front ready to greet you. You come. 